Midlands Teaching Partnership. Uh, welcome to this session of our um, practice week. Um, we've had a brilliant week so far with lots and lots of different uh, sessions um, sort of spanning uh, children and adult social work, uh, education and research. It's been really, really interesting. i um, excited to, uh, to welcome you to this regional approach to the development of social work research. Um, from the uh, Midlands Foundation Partnership in Kiel um, as well. So, um, so welcome to you guys as well. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background as well about the uh, teaching partnership. But just before I do, just want to let you know that the session is being recorded um, and that's so we can use that as a, as a resource on our website. OK, so just to make you aware of that. Um, so the teaching partnership then is one of 23 accredited social work teaching partnerships in England and we're funded by the Department of Education. And we have a total of uh, 28 partners, which includes local authorities, children's trusts, NHS trusts and higher education institutes, which is universities. Um, we work with our partners to ensure high quality social work education and social work practice across the region. And so one of the ways we do this is by facilitating CPD opportunities um, like this one. And, uh, and another way we do this is by getting involved in, in research, um, which again um, is linked to this as well. Um, so you, we work with um, we. Uh, work with students, um, ASYEs and practitioners um, across the region um, to help uh, you know, really deliver high quality training and development. That's really our, our sort of key aim there. Um, so please do give your feedback um, on these sessions. It's really important that, that we know, you know how your experience has been at this so that we can um, shape future learning events um, as well. You can do this via a link that will be put in the chat towards the end um, to a, a survey. Um, but you could also get in touch with us um, on Twitter um, via email um, as well um, if you want to. So I am, I'm going to hand over in a minute to uh, Karen, but just to let you know, um, you can use the chat function um, for any questions. I'm sure um, that the presenters will be happy to, to answer them um, either throughout or at the end. Um, just again, another reminder just to keep your cameras off and your microphones on mute um, unless you're sort of asking, you've been asked to ask a question. Um, you can turn on live captions um, if you want to by pressing the three dots um, and then selecting that from there. So. Without any further ado, I'll hand over to Karen. Morning, everybody, and welcome to the session. So um, today we've got a fantastic bunch of, of staff and colleagues. So we've got a regional approach to the development of social work research, and that's by Keel University and Midlands Partnership NHS Trust. So we've got four sessions. So uh, we've got practice to research and practice. So my colleague Paul Campbell will share um, what it's like within the organisation from um, a sort of clinical point of view in relation to research and how we can really use that ethos to underpin research for social care moving forward. Then we'll go into an analysis of social care research or the screen um, project that we undertook within the partnership and that was very much focused on social care and social work and the understanding of research within the organisation. And then the fantastic Karen Roscoe uh, will um, deliver a session on narrative, inquiry and linguistics, which is absolutely amazing, followed by COVID-19 and adult safeguarding and again by the fabulous Laura from Keele. So if I quickly uh, introduce the partners again we've got Paul Campbell, myself, Karen Roscoe and Laura Pritchard Jones from Keel. So drop any questions in the chat box um, to any, any of the four of us as we go along and we'll gladly answer those and have a bit of a discussion at the end of the session. So what we know about social care research we definitely know that it underpins social care values it can underpin anti-discriminatory, anti-oppressive practice, very, very pertinent in the current um, language today that we've seen within social work. We also know that it can address inequalities, debunk myths, prejudices and injustices. And we also know that it can help in quality standards, raising the practice that we all work in. It can, it can underpin ethical situations and it can under, underpin poly, political change as well particularly during this time as we see revisions for the Mental Capacity Act and Mental Health Act. So we see those reforms and reviews, they're particularly underpinned by research in the field. So importantly, 
For practitioners, we have learning as well. And we have that from the moment that we start within the university. We go through our degrees, we go through all the learning, we go through the CPD and we continue that. So um, for the four of us on the, on the session today, we've all been in practice either clinically or within social work practice for a number of years now, probably in excess of 100 years between us. And, and basically every day is a school day for me. We all learn every day and we all we all use that to, to inform our ideas, our research and the actions that we take as social workers and clinicians. So we know that research within health organisations currently exists and it's probably fair to say that there's a huge amount of research in um, various clinician clinician sort of professions and that be it nursing, allied health professionals, but basically, from my point of view, I work in an NHS organisation. It's an integrated organisation and we have an amazing research team that we work alongside. And our aim is to really develop social care and social work research within the organisation. So for me, how do we learn from this and how can we really take the sort of evidence base and the learning from our colleagues within the organisation? Importantly, how do we build relationships that co-produce research as well? How do we engage our partners within higher education institutes and across our region? How do we do that? So we've sort of begun that already through the screen project. And I'm going to introduce my colleague now, Paul Campbell, who's going to give you a little bit of a flavour of research within our organisation. It's from a multi, uh, I can't never say this word, word uh, Multi, is it, Paul, just step in, multiskeletal, it is, multidisciplinary, <laughs> multiskeletal um, point of view, but Paul's going to just give you a bit of a flavour in terms of what that means for allied health professionals and how we can really work together. So now I'll hand you over to Paul. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, yeah, musculoskeletal, that's, that's the one, I, I thought it was something else. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to this session. Uh, I'm really pleased to, to be able to do that. Uh, I'm a senior research associate at the r &I department uh, within MPFT. Um, and I'm also the lead for the screen project, which Karen is going to talk about uh, later. Um, and the, the central aim of, of the screen project is to, uh, you know, activate and get social care, social workers involved uh, in research uh, for social care and social work. Uh, so that's the primary aim of SCREEN. And uh, what we did within SCREEN was to run a survey uh, to all social care staff at MPFT. And one of the uh, one of the things that we did was have open ended questions within that survey. And um, a, kind of, a kind of key theme that came out of that was the so what question. Uh, and it's sort of, you know, research is great. It sounds fantastic, brilliant. But so what? What what difference is it going to make to me? What difference is it going to make to uh, my practice? Uh, and of course, that's a very, very important question. Um, so I thought it would be good to cover this in my presentation. Um, and what I'm going to do is give you a story about how practitioners uh, have embarked in research that's then made a difference to their practice. Um, I have to disclose, however, that my background is not in social work or social care, uh, and so I can't really draw my experience from there, although I'm quite sure that there are, uh, you know, similar stories uh, there. So my experience is in primary care, so that's where my example comes from. Uh, but I still think the story will be useful to you and parallels can be drawn. Uh, so Karen, can I ask for the next slide, please? Uh, so the story begins with the players uh, here. Uh, the majority of research that was carried out in this uh, body of work was uh, carried out by practitioners. Um, and in this case, it's uh, general practitioners and physiotherapists. Um, so can I ask for the next slide, please? So it all started with the problem. Uh, in this case, it was a clinical observation. Uh, and what it was, was that they noticed that uh, a significant proportion of people who came to consult about back pain for the first time uh, didn't seem to do so well, didn't respond to treatment and went on to develop chronic back pain. 
And that's certainly something that's reflected in the wider literature, where about five to 10% of people who go and see their GP or physiotherapist with back pain will develop chronic back pain. And that's a really big problem in primary care because uh, that small percentage then go on to use about 90% of all the healthcare resources used to treat back pain. So that was the, the clinical problem that was uh, recognised by practitioners. Uh, can I ask for the next slide, please? So this led to the first research question, and this research question centred around, well, if that's the case, how can we spot uh, individuals that are going to have this long term poor prognosis? Are there any factors at the point of consultation that can be recognised that predict that a person is going to have a poor outcome? Uh, so that was the, the first research question uh, that developed from the recognition of this problem. Uh, next slide, please. And that led to uh, a lot of research activity to try and identify what these factors were using systematic reviews uh, to spot what has been done in the literature previously and also using uh, secondary data analysis using existing cohort data sets to test whether the factors found in these reviews actually did predict that someone would develop chronic back pain. Um, so that's the, the sort of body of research uh, that uh, answered that first question on what are the factors that predict someone has a poor back, uh, a poor outcome later on. Uh, next slide, please. And this led to the next research question. And you'll find in research that whatever you do always leads to uh, something new. But the next research question in this story was, now we know what the factors are uh, that uh, predict someone's going to have a, a poor outcome. Is there any way in which we can capture that within the consultation right at the very start? Is there a tool that could be made that could be filled in very quickly uh, to spot which individuals are at high risk of this poor outcome? And also uh, thinking around what are we going to do with these people that are high risk? What's going to be different in terms of the treatment that they get? Uh, next slide, please. So this led to the next body of work, and uh, this uh, work was predominantly carried out by one of my colleagues, Dr. Jonathan Hill, uh, over at Keele. And Jonathan was a practicing physiotherapist within the NHS uh, who had an interest in research uh, and uh, decided to embark on a career development PhD to answer uh, these questions uh, based on this topic. And his task was to design a tool that could easily capture and identify those individuals at high risk of a poor outcome at the point of consultation, and also to design uh, a type of treatment that would be suitable for those people. So that was Jonathan's, so that was a practitioner then embarking on a research career. Uh, can I ask for the next slide, please, Karen? So just to give you sort of an explanation of how this involved, I need to just very briefly tell you about what the usual management is for back pain in primary care. So obviously, if there's something seriously wrong, then you'll be given an urgent referral. Uh, but otherwise than that, you enter a step care model. And that is, you might go and see your doctor or physiotherapist and be given some self-management advice. And then that'll move up maybe to get some exercises, get some stronger medication and so on and so forth. Uh, and it takes an enormous amount of time before you get to specialist referral, sometimes years before you get to that level. And the thing about having chronic back pain is the longer you have it, the worse your outcome is going to be, the less likely you are to recover. Uh, so there's a problem there. Uh, can I ask for the next slide, please? So Jonathan's model was a stratified model. And because of the tool spotted those at high risk of a poor outcome right at the point of consultation, uh, what was decided was to use a stratified model where those at high risk were sent to specialist referrals straight away. Um, so they didn't have to go through that long process of going back to see their doctor uh, and coming away, not getting better and so on and so forth. And also the model makes sure that those people that are at low risk who will generally get better by themselves straight away are not overtreated as well. Uh, so that's the, the sort of whole model that Jonathan uh, designed in his PhD. Um, can I ask the next slide, please? So then that had to be tested within a trial. And a randomized control trial was carried out to test the stratified model using the tool uh, against your usual care. And the results of this trial was published in one of the world's leading medical journals, The Lancet. 
Um, and the results of the trial showed that using this stratified approach uh, was clinically beneficial to patients compared to usual care, as well as uh, saving uh, money by not overtreating people that wouldn't benefit from it. So uh, fantastic results there. Uh, next slide, please. This led, led on to a whole set of continued work uh, around this model, um, including replication of the tool in different languages. I think we're up to about 40 different languages translations of the tool now. Uh, there was new trials in different countries to test whether this would work in different healthcare systems. And also importantly, a lot of implementation work to ensure that this type of approach would work in normal practice as opposed to trying to, you know, trying to run in a, a randomized control trial. So a whole host of work just from that first initial uh, first initial PhD work by Jonathan. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of impact, uh, I've just documented here a couple of slides that show impact. So this one here is a case study by Public Health England on the implementation of this stratified approach for the treatment of back pain. And the next slide, please. And this is uh, uh, another slide that shows that the NICE guidelines, which are the sort of clinical guidelines uh, for treatment in primary care and healthcare in general, uh, have endorsed the stratified approach and use of the start back tool for the treatment of back pain. And this, of course, will lead to a sort of sea change, uh, a sea change in the way back pain is treated in the UK because many people refer to the NICE guidelines uh, for how they do that. So a huge impact. Uh, nationwide. Uh, next slide, please. And just to say that this uh, approach, this stratified approach has been used worldwide as well. So it's had a, an impact beyond the UK. Um, so fantastic sort of uh, impact in terms of the work that was done. Uh, next slide, please. And I just thought I'd mention personal impact as well. Many of the people involved in this research are now regarded as world leading experts. Uh, notably uh, Nadine Foster and Jonathan Hill, both of them physiotherapists um, who embarked on research careers. Uh, so that's fantastic uh, personal impact as well. And next slide, please. Uh, and so I just draw you back now to uh, this story where it began with the players. Uh, these world leading experts now started off as practitioners with an interest in research that recognised uh, a clinical problem, a problem that they thought they could solve. And I hope that this story has illustrated that practitioners doing research can make a difference to practice. Uh, I really believe that it is essential that practitioners are involved in the design of research uh, because it has relevance then to practice. Uh, so again, thank you very much for allowing me to contribute to this session, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat. I think you're, you're on mute. mute. Oh. <laughs> Is that it? Have I come back? Yes, you're back, Karen. I'm back. Yeah. Can you see the, the slideshow? Yeah. Brilliant. I'll just whiz it through to where it was. Apologies, every time I touch my, my MS Teams, my slideshow goes, which is just the beauty of technology. So I'm just going to get to the stage where we were. And again, I do apologise. You can tell I'm not a professional clicker. <laughs> so here we are again. So thank you for listening to Paul. Um, and that just, you know, thank you, Paul. That just reiterates the sort of impact and the, the beauty that social care practitioners, clinical practitioners, um, AHPs can, can bring to research within the field. So I just want to share some time now talking about the Screen Project, um, again, within the Midlands Partnership Trust. Um, and it's social care research engagement. And we undertook this um, earlier in the year, really, so that we could really get a picture of what social care research was, what the understanding was within the organisation, so that we could improve skills, knowledge and expert expertise, so that we could really support um, individuals or service users or citizens, patients out there in the field. So we wanted to find answers to those things that are unknown. 
and those are the, the questions that uh, Paul spoke about. So those are the issues that we have every day in practice because we all have them and it's where do we take those? Where do we actually take them to find out the answers? And that's for us was what research is about really. And it's also about filling the vacuum and, and knowledge as well so that we could really develop our understanding about research and practice moving forward for the future. And also, as Paul says, discovering new ways of working the, you know, the ways that we work in practice, you know, if we've been doing it five, ten years, it may not necessarily be the most appropriate way to practice in the current climate. We knew that there was a large disparity between research activity and research in terms of funding for social care research, funding for social work research. We knew within our local teaching partnership um, that this disparity um, existed, but we really wanted to raise the profile of social care research across the region. So within our organisation, we apply to the West Midlands Clinical Research Network. And, and again, there's that clin clinical word there. Um, so it would be absolutely amazing to develop a practice research network for me across the West Midlands. And that might be something that we look towards for the future. And what we did was we were successful in obtaining 12-month um, funding. So we, we developed a project called the Screen Project, and that was really to engage social care practitioners within the organisation so that one, we could start to embed a, a culture of research, but we could also understand um, what practitioners felt of research, what they knew of research and if they participated. So. Our aims and ambitions, we really wanted to inspire, and that was raising awareness of research. And that, we did a couple of conferences, we invited social work and social care staff internally, and we also developed um, a specialist interest group, a SIG, so that people um, that were really interested in research, and this is at every level within social care and social work, we've got assistant directors there, we've got frontline staff, and we've got other individuals from the research team as well. We all come together, and also from the higher education, uh, from Keele University. So we all come together um, on, on a bi-weekly, um, fortnightly uh, meeting, and we talk about research, we talk about what's coming, and also how we can improve and apply for research bids so that we can take our issues forward. So we have now have a research champion uh, who is absolutely amazing, Stacey Wild, and she helps us to really understand and drive forward the research within the organisation. And again, um, any ideas that we get from staff, we bring them to the group and we discuss them. If there's research out there, then we, we can share that within the organisation or we can develop further um, grants or bids so that we can apply for further research projects. So within the screen um, project, what we really wanted to understand was did staff see research as part of professional development? Was research relevant within practice? Was, um, was research within team discussions? Was it in team meetings? And did it relate to practice? And did staff have access to social care research? And that could have been publications, research findings, reports. Um, was it shared amongst the team? Or did they do it personally? And importantly, would, would staff like to be involved in research activities moving forward? As Paul said, uh, we ran a survey out to all practitioners within the organisation and it was really, really quite, um, quite positive. It was taken up by a lot of staff. So the majority of staff that completed the survey were social workers at 32.69% and then unregistered staff, including social care assessors at 25.96%. And along the bottom of that graph, you can sort of see we've got management in there, uh, personalisation, social inclusion in there, sensory team, safeguarding, so we including business support. So it covered the wide sort of gamut, really, of, um, of social work and social care staff and teams. So the vast majority, 89.42% of staff, had not been involved in research or research training within the last three years. And that absolutely astounds me because I think a lot of the research that we're involved in, whether that be re uh, reading a paper, whether that be taking part in a survey, staff didn't recognise that as, as being research. They understood it as CPD, continuous professional development, but by completing a survey and taking part, I think one of the, the things that came back from that is 
they didn't understand or they didn't have access to um, the research um, end result, um, the research findings, and sometimes because it it takes such a long time to get those research findings back to staff and back to, you know, to get something really concrete. A lot of staff fed back that they'd forgotten that they'd, they'd applied to the survey. So the next question was, did they feel that it was relevant to the professional development? And again, 73.7% .7 of staff agreed that research should be within professional development, which, yeah, I totally agree with that one. So what did staff tell us? So frontline staff said that they lacked confidence and opportunity to get involved. Um, one staff member said, for me, research is vital within the field of social work. I consider that it's discussed at every opportunity in see meetings, um, specialist areas, i.e. deafness, impact on people, which is what Paul spoke about, within supervision. And if this relates to a, sp a specific um, individual I might be working with, I'll certainly incorporate research um, with students as well. Um, and another comment, in fairness, some of it is as useful, although you can, can get overloaded. So again, staff were getting some access to research, but it was whether they sort of attributed what they were receiving in terms of survey and papers as research. So again, the questions raised. How do you identify good research and good quality research? This is, these are the questions that staff particularly wanted to ask us. And how is the subject chosen? Where does it go if you've got a, a, an issue within practice? Where could you take that? And what research is taking place? And what has been done in the past? What, research, uh, what does research have in relation to shaping the future of social work? How do we mould the process? including processes and policy. So I think that's a particularly important question. So um, just to sort of finalise the screen projects, we've undertaken the initial screening, the initial scope, scoping of our staff. And what we've done is we've developed a specialist interest group. We've also developed the research facilitator role. We've also begun to develop our own research questions. We've started to put bids out there and we've become successful in, in another bid which is absolutely amazing which is the screen two project so now we're going to build on um, actually getting some research out there to within our organization so that staff can start to bring their issues forward and we can take those um, further so our next leg of the journey we have a clinically appraised topics group or cat group um, so that staff can come together and they can bring the issues and they can they, as a group, it's a bit like an action learning set. As a group, they bring the issues, they look for research in the field. If there's none, we, we build our own uh, research questions and we take those further. So developing awareness and contribution within research is absolutely key. Again, identifying practice issues, again, key. What matters most to practitioners, you know, practitioners on the ground, they're, they're in it every day, 100%, working with patients, service users and citizens. So it's how do we use research to really engage and develop our practice? Again, developing research questions that really matter to staff as well. It's pointless, you know, um, directors um, or anybody at um, a higher level within an organisation to develop research questions um, on their own because it may not be pertinent to practice on the ground. So I think that's really important that we've got every level of practitioner involved. And also, again, having um, research studies that have an impact within practice. So I'm now going to hand you over to my colleague, Karen Roscoe at Keele University. And um, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Um, that was uh, a really interesting um, presentation and gave a really good context of the aims and what we're trying, what Screen are trying to present. So I shall try to follow on from your brilliant presentation. Um, could somebody, would you like to give me the next slide? OK, so I'm going to talk to you today about narrative inquiry, which is a way of um, a sort of way of approaching life in a, in a particular way. And it also involves a lot of linguistics. And uh, as a critical practitioner, I really tend to only engage in research where there's a problem focus, but 
not in a negative way where there is more it, it's problem orientated a bit like going back to what paul says is it's practice problem orientated the idea is either to influence policy or practice or you know it it could be less than that it could be impact um within your uh, organization okay next slide so my work specializes really on narratives and storytelling and linguistics and the reason that i specialize in this is because much of the work that we do in social work is predominantly centered around storytelling when we go out and we do an assessment when we discuss people's social care needs um, when we talk to families so you, you will often be given information about uh, social context by storytelling processes. So narrative theory is underpinned by the philosophy of language and what we say and how we say it in organisations is really important as well as with our service users. So we know that much of human life is conducted through story events and we tend to construct our experiences in life around certain events and then we then mould those events together which then create what's called a coherent story. Um, and many of our social institutions are almost almost entirely um, available for providing opportunities for telling and retelling stories. So an example of this is Irving, Irving Goffman used to call them front stage and backstage performances. So we know that we have certain expectations, you know, perhaps in meetings or, um, you know, we know our expectations about professionalism. But the reality is that, that behind closed doors, people will always talk to one another. And what you can tend to find out from the storytelling processes in an organisation is it represents a lot about that culture and the assumptions underpinning um, the culture and how it manifests itself through practice. Next slide, please. Uh, could you click the next slide, please? Oh, thanks, Karen. Um, so we understand narratives through language analysis and we um, narratives function on three levels. The first point really is ideational function, which really links to the fact that anything we talk about in relation to narratives represents something about our identity. And we will make sense out of identity within the social interactions of other people. So, for example, if you get labelled or people view or judge you in a particular way, that tells me that that is one part of somebody's interpretation. But how the individual socially constructs their own world will be their interpretation. And we can often see that interpretations of events can be far from an individual's perspective. So an important part of narratives is to understand that when people do tell stories about experiences, it will convey something about their identity and their values. So the next thing about narratives is there is always a text structure. So like I've said, individuals will structure events around their life, put them together, make sense out of them, and then decide, if you like, how they want to categorise the experience. Think about your mind as if it's a filing cabinet and you have all of these previous experiences that are in your brain and we categorise information in a particular way. Then when you come across a new situation which has a similar or similar feeling, then it's almost like you get the filing cabinet out of your mind, get the correct file and say this experience links to that experience. So let's put it in the same file and in the same category of my brain. But the problem with that is that sometimes we construct those meanings and join these events together when they might not necessarily be completely and utterly uh, relevant. And so we begin to structure, structure a reality in a particular way. And what we then do with the narrative is rather than just seeing it as something about an individual's interpretation, we link the story to the person's wider social context. How does culture influence um, an individual? How does um, 
language within that culture and in, um, influence an individual? How does gender, how do the expectations of society and so on? And then that enables us to understand why does this story make sense to this individual? Why are they telling this story in a particular way? And how does it bear relationship to the social context in which they exist? Next slide, please. So narrative analysis allows a researcher to make systematic studies of anyone's personal experiences and to how to analyse important events that have been constructed by subjects. Whilst there are different um, theoretical approaches in narratives, I would say that my position and my research is often centred around sociological approaches and critical linguistic theories. And the reason I choose these approaches is because they extend to the issues of power. Whilst on the one hand you could say that power is socially constructed, the reason why I cho choose critical theory is because we can't ignore the impact of powerful social structures and therefore the impact itself of these structures then have real material consequences. So for me only to look at language in a social context and stop there, that wasn't enough. I needed to look at the power underpinning the, the, the language and the narratives. How does that link to wider structures of society? And how might it reinforce marginalised groups, represent power dynamics, etc.? Within this position, then, narratives are seen as social actors. They will perform in one way with one group, they will tell a story in another group with another way. And we do this. We have different social selves. If you think about Irving Goffman, he talked about these social masks that we wear and that you are navigating the world. And he, he did say that we were all actors in a play. And in some respect, Irving Goffman was right, because we need to perform on a day-to-day -day basis in different ways, in different contexts. Um, but we can either be really active about our own stories in the sense where we unpack our own stories and say, how does that make sense? How might that represent my own assumptions? How might that link to a previous experience? And how am I linking this together with that? And we can unpick, which is, a, you know, the term is used, deconstruction. Or we can be really passive and we can stand back and just say, well, that's who I am and that's that. And this is my story and there's no budging from that story. But if you imagine working with disempowered individuals and marginalised groups, then in some respects you have to take on board that sometimes people's own stories are equally as oppressive to themselves as other people's stories and that sometimes individual stories can hold them back. So this is why in some respects I've reached the stage I have in my own life and my own achievements is because I constantly reconstruct my experiences, check them out, redefine them. And I'm one of those individuals who always looks for the positives. Um, and these are the skills that I would like to pass on to other people, researchers, service users, lecturers, practitioners. OK, next slide, please. Two minutes, Karen. Oh, gosh, already. Um, why do, let's skip this slide then. So why do we use narrative approaches? Well, narrative methods can be used as a methodological tool and the task of critical social work, as I've said, is to deconstruct, which is unpack these linguistic um, accounts. And the analyst is really interested in how the individual has sequenced their events together. Next slide, please. I apologise now, we're going to be rushing these next two minutes. Um, and let's give an example of how we can look at a narrative. OK, so this is language that all of you practitioners out there will recognise out there in the real world of social work. So when I did my PhD, I asked social work students what it felt like when they first went into a practice domain. And what I was trying to analyse was how they were grappling and juggling with a new professional identity. So an important point is when we draw on the language of society, we enter the linguistic world of meaning, the already interpreted world. So look at some of these quotes, very bureaucratic, governed by rules, regulations, administrations. Some people said things like it's so office based. I actually thought that, you know, I was on the wrong course. Um, you feel like you're banging your head against a brick wall and people felt they were more like a PA than a social worker. Now, you will have heard these taken for granted ways of talking in culture. So that's why I've said sound familiar. Next slide, please. 
But if we take a closer look at what can, what makes this narrative coherent in the sense that how does it enable the story to hold together and make sense? That the, what, what is the contrast narrative? And these link to people's expectations about their construction about what they thought social work was before they came in. So here's some quotes about, I wanted social work to be one-to-one -one and make things happen. So this one-to-one -one kept coming up all the time. So what that represents on a wider structural level is that society tends to individualize problems rather than take a wider structural approach. So we refer to these as individualistic approaches to social work. So we'll use language like social responsibility, uh, putting the, the responsibility back onto the individual. So we give an example that then what we're saying to people in poverty or children and families that we're blaming them for their responsibility um, and they need to take responsibility for their behaviours around their children or their drug misuse or their alcohol alcoholism. And yet we ignore the wider structural inequalities that actually lead to these outcomes. And, and that that represents a certain way in which British social work operates. Next slide, please. So I've referred to this by using what's um, Hegelian dialectics, a philosopher, and he talked about um, all reality is presented to us as human beings in the in the context of the, the thesis, meaning there's always an original construction and then the antithesis. So we've always got the opposite end of any truth. So if you think about any life event, you can construct it one way and then you can actually then um, look at the antithesis of that because there'll always be an opposing point of view. But we need to look at, at social work by not trying to fix it into two opposing perspectives. If, if you try to fit social work into a one thesis, then you're going to use the antithesis, which is the bureaucracy of social work, as a means in which to tell yourself that it's not the right job for you and it wasn't what I came out to do. In my view, that creates a sense of cognitive dissonance or what the Marxists referred to as alienation. So we need to problematize these binary oppositions in language and how they represent the worldview of social work. We can't, and I often say this about practitioners and working with service users, we shouldn't use language which represents a polar opposite. You know, like we say the weak student or the strong person or they're great academically. We need to be much more varied in the way that we um, conceptualise individual circumstances and understand that westernised um, language is structured very much around binary oppositions. So we need to merge and step in between the binary oppositions. And the point then is that we can structure meaning of practice on the basis of including and, and excluding certain narratives. And so narratives then of social work aren't fixed, they're open to interpretation. We can negotiate meanings and we can reconstruct them. OK, final slide. Thank you, Karen. Next one. So in my research, it's very clear if you ask a, a social worker, can you give me an example where you did have a really good um, experience of practice? Then look at this top quote where it contradicts all of those previous stories. They say on the one hand it's really bureaucratic and I feel like a PA. Then if you unpack it a bit further and you ask, you will find that there is pockets of practice that, that um, both practitioners and students have really enjoyed. So what that tells me is that we need to encourage different foregrounds of stories that are less heard in social work to celebrate the good aspects rather than just focusing on the wider structural inequality and the systems and the organizations which challenge our values if you like so my final concluding point then is while practitioners might enter an already interpreted linguistic occupational world they will soon discover the world is fallible and open to interpretation such an either or perspective in the form of one to one social work versus all the paperwork is invariably a matter of both coexisting and we have to work within these bureaucratic organisations. So rather than view these ideas in opposition, narratives and linguistics enable us to draw on what is called a dialectical approach. And dialectic goes back to Hegelian dialectics, this idea that um, there's a cause and effect, there's always an opposite. And so 
any reality or any way in which we see reality is always riddled with contradictions. Nothing is concrete, nothing is clear if you're a philosopher. You must juggle as a social work practitioner if never fully resolve the endorsement of your socially constructed values and ethics whilst being located in a very neoliberalist strapped caste welfare state which perhaps doesn't represent sometimes those values and you will face internal conflicts but that is part and package of being a social worker. Thank you very much. Morning everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about one of the research projects that we've got on um, at Kiel at the moment uh, and that we're working on that was very uh, kindly funded by the Health Foundation. Um, so if we could have the next slide please Karen. Thank you. So the title of this project is looking at adult social care and safeguarding during COVID-19. So it's looking at uh, the impact that COVID and the pandemic has had on uh, adult safeguarding, primarily adult safeguarding practice, but, but largely through the lens of social care, given that obviously safeguarding is uh, really at the heart of, of social care as well. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. Thank you. So just a little bit about the project aim. So what do we set out to do um, when we uh, started this particular project? So we set out with the sort of aim in mind to investigate the impact that COVID has had on adult safeguarding law. We know there were certain um, changes, certainly to the way that law took effect in practice. So the changes to assessment methods and things like that, uh, of mental capacity assessments, for example. Um, and and how that those changes uh, have impacted practitioners' ability to safeguard adults at risk of abuse and neglect. So uh, a little bit about the team. I'm, I'm heading the project at the moment and I'm working with colleagues, Mark Eccleston-Turner, um, who is also over in law school, Professor Alison Brammer, who some of you may have heard of, currently head of the law school um, and also a very extensive experience, obviously, teaching in social work and researching in social work. And uh, we're also joined by our uh, research assistant, Monique Memmi, as well. So next slide, please, Karen. Fantastic. So what generated this project? Why did we decide, hang on, there's something, there's a project here that what, you know, we need to find out more about the impact that COVID has had on um, social work practice and safeguarding practice. Well, firstly, I came across a lot of informal and anecdotal concerns about adult safeguarding from practitioners. So we know about the increases in particular types of abuse and the concerns about lockdown um, and um, the effect that lockdown would have had on detecting um, abuse, certainly things like domestic violence. Um, the ability to safeguard in care homes, obviously, that was something that practitioners when we were talking about this project. Uh, and we did work with a number of um, organisations, practitioner organisations, to actually formulate and, and develop the project and develop the sort of areas of research. Um, so, yeah, so uh, that was the, the second concern that was very often raised so about care homes and, and practitioners um, feeling that their hands were tied in terms of being able to effectively undertake any sort of adult safeguarding um, responsibilities in relation to care homes, given the uh, sort of widespread uh, stopping of visits and stopping of inspections. We also had changes to the legal framework under the CARE Act in what were called easements. Um, they've just been removed uh, in the uh, latest review of the coronavirus legislation. Uh, but there were concerns when they came out in particular that, that actually uh, these might lead to wide scale um, removal of care packages or changes. And, and although the easement said um, actually, you still have to uh, provide something if it would be a breach of someone's human rights not to. Um, there were general concerns that actually a lot of the rights under the CARE Act were rolled back or could have been rolled back uh, under the coronavirus legislation. We know now statistically that not many local authorities actually enacted the higher tier of easements, which might have led to that. Um, and also... I, I, I think generally there's a lack of systematic understanding of the way in which the pandemic has impacted adult safeguarding. So we perhaps have a little bit more data about how it's affected adult social care. We know obviously a lot of the statistical data around care homes and the mortality rate in care homes. But what we wanted to really do is put adult safeguarding at the heart of a project, because I don't think I think it's fair to say that actually you don't often get safeguarding adult safeguarding as the heart of a research project. And so that's really what we wanted to do with this particular uh, project. And we wanted to investigate in particular the way that pr practitioners have adapted, how they coped uh, and what resources they've drawn on, how they've adapted um, and how they've gone about their safeguarding activity, notwithstanding all the changes that have come about as a result of COVID. Uh, next slide, please, Karen. 
Thank you. So um, these generally are the areas of research investigation. So the, the kind of areas that we want to find out more about. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the methods in a, in a slide or two's time. So first of all, the impact of COVID on those legal obligations. So we're doing a wide ranging literature review to have a look at the, the extent to which legal obligations did actually change during the pandemic. And one of the aims of this project is to think about how we can use the findings moving forward if we ever go to a similar circumstances. Uh, fingers crossed, we won't, and <laughs> fingers crossed we're coming out of COVID. Um, but certainly uh, there's something there to say, well, actually, can we learn from this moving forward? What can we learn? You know, we often hear the words that, um, you know, I don't think the world will ever be quite Quite the same. Well, hopefully this project will also contribute to that. If the world isn't going to be quite the same, then what aspects that COVID has changed that we want to keep and what aspects do we not want to keep? What have, what have practitioners struggled with uh, and what has been beneficial to their practice? Um, the impact of COVID on putting those sort of legal frameworks into practice under the Mental Capacity Act, under the Care Act assessments, uh, under the Deprivation and Liberty Safeguards, what challenges have they faced in continuing to meet those legal obligations, those assessments that, that, that practitioners are required to do under those? So uh, the impact of COVID on the practice of adult safeguarding through the operation of safeguarding adults boards. So again, we're taking a very broad and holistic approach to this to really put safeguarding at its heart. And we're going to look beyond just social work and social care, uh, that arena. And we're also going to look at uh, professionals who have a wider remit or a broader remit for safeguarding adults, such as those uh, who sit with or um, are involved uh, quite extensively with safeguarding adults boards. To identify the strengths and the strategies that practitioners drew on in responding to these changes and these challenges. And one thing I would say about this, this um, study is that it is driven by the practitioner experience. So this is what we set out to um, find out. So I've, I've never been a social work practitioner. Obviously, I come from a legal background. My area is, is um, the law around adult social care, Mental Capacity Care Act. And what I really wanted to learn more about is um, actually what have practitioners done? How have they coped? How have they managed to go about their safeguarding, um, their safeguarding uh, activities, their responsibilities? Um, and actually, how has COVID impacted on their ability to do that? Next slide, please, Karen. So in terms of the outcomes and the outputs, um, we, we do have a website available um, and there's also a link to the survey. So we're doing both surveys and interviews. So um, we have a website and there's a link to the survey there. I'll also put a link to the survey um, in the chat in a second. Um, this actually, what we're trying to do there and what our research assistant has done very um, uh, very extensively is put together a list of sort of further resources. So a really wide ranging list of resources, uh, websites, things like that. A one stop shop really for a lot of the things that have been published and gone out there during the pandemic, both from professional, but also from the academic um, side of things. Um, and that will uh, that will be regularly updated over the duration of the project, which is due to run till the end of this year. Uh, we'll also be hosting a number of online events, hopefully towards the end of the year, which will be free and that'll draw on a lot of the findings. So in terms of the early findings, certainly because we're well into the sort of data collection now, um, we're finding that obviously practitioners have had to be really creative with the way that they've done things and the way that they've gone about their responsibilities and their, their assessments and things like that. So um, hopefully the, the webinars will draw on a lot of those findings and the ways in which detailing a little bit more about um, the way in which practitioners have have been created and uh, creative and what methods they've found for for really sort of um trying to do uh the best in terms of adult safeguarding and what's been a really really challenging situation and obviously there'll also be a series of publications and briefings i'm hoping that the first one will go on the community care website in the next month or so uh, hopefully we'll be working on that next year but it's also an opportunity because we're working um and we're feeding back to the department of health and social care there's a lot of talk obviously that there might be an inquiry um, but also uh, we are feeding back to the Department of Health and Social Care. Hopefully there'll be a meeting arranged um, between us and a series of other research projects looking at COVID in social care over the summer. Um, and so this is an opportunity really for frontline and non-frontline professionals working in adult social care and safeguarding to feed those views and concerns into a national in-depth research project. Um, and that those findings will be fed back to the Department of Health and Social Care. Next slide, please, Karen. Lovely, thank you. So um, two ways to participate. If anyone does want to participate, if you have any sort of responsibility for, for safeguarding or social work um, in uh, during the pandemic, either frontline um, or non-frontline, you're welcome to participate in the survey. Um, and I'll put a link to that in the uh, chat now. There we go. Um, this is aimed specifically at frontline practitioners in, in social work, uh, any degree of, sort of adult social work or, or adult safeguarding. 
shouldn't take you on any longer than about 30 minutes if you wish to participate. Interview participate, participants, we're looking at for both um, for both uh, frontline and non-frontline practitioners. And these are, are more in-depth, semi-structured interviews where we're able to delve a little bit more into the details of the challenges that COVID has posed and the way in which practitioners have been creative or found to be creative in, in dealing with some of those challenges that COVID has, has, has posed. And we see welcome to email me if you want to take part in either of those. Next slide, please. So I think that's it for mine. Um, but if any, like I say, if anybody uh, wants to uh, get in touch with me, then I think my email is on the last slide. And do feel free to click through to the survey if you want to take part in the survey. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, just a short word from me, just to say thank you, everybody, um, for listening. Is there any um, questions at all in the chat before we, we leave? We've just got a few minutes before we go. Yes, I, I could think... ask a question, if that's OK, to Karen Roscoe. Oh, just no, just thought I was really fascinated uh, again by by your research there. And it, it's just that sort of thing about you. The, the wish for the one to one, I think that was brought up in the in the question thread as well. The wish for a one to one approach, but a, a balance between the structural issues. Now, I just wondered what your your thoughts around how structural elements can change, I guess, is what I'm asking, because people can change the one to one sort of things. But how, how do we go about changing those structural things, Karen? So. I, what tends to happen, like anything in health and social care, you get this policy and then it expects you to change all your documents and all your service level agreements and your assessments and your care plans. In the, in the literature, we call it, in the radical social work literature, it's referred to as quiet challenges. Now, if you're like me, who's really driven by social justice, I'm not sure I can quietly challenge. But when I was in practice, what I tended to do was but I used law as the tool to challenge the system. So I would do all the usual, you know, go to your director. Have you thought about this? Are we this or all of that? But you, what you have to do is much more subtle in the sense where you're, you're quietly challenging all the time. And then so eventually what I would say is, OK, I understand that this is about money because it's often about money in social services. But I would then say, but are we in breach of this act? I might be in breach of this law. And what would happen if there was a case audit file? When you start talking like that to directors, managers and senior managers, and we live in a highly accountable organisations. So when you begin to say, well, actually, I understand this is about money, but there are wider laws that are outside of money. And then the things around the bureaucracy, what we've done to try to change cultures in the past in local authorities is we've introduced new processes, so like solution focused circles with practitioners, rather than sitting there and allowing practitioners to just go on about inequalities, the structural. What we try to do is change and frame the conversation to be much more restorative and solution focused. It's like it goes back to what you said, Paul. So what? It's like there's no point telling me these things unless you can come up with a series of suggestions of ways in which we might challenge this internally. And then you can be much more radical and take a much more social policist approach. And, you know, you can lobby things by doing research with service users to get the feedback. Yeah, because often your service user voice is more powerful. And I've used research to say, here's the impact. And then I go, so what are we going to do about it? Yeah, no, thank you very much. I, I certainly think there's lots of scope there for, for research around all the components of what you've just mentioned there. I think there's, yeah. you know, fantastic opportunities. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. On that note, um, if I can mention, we're just about to close. Um, hands up from me for radical social work. 
and solution focused strengths based social work. So thank everybody for coming today. I hope you've enjoyed the session. We've tried to give you a real flavour of what research means within the, the local teaching partnership and across our organisations. So the uh, presentations will be shared, so you'll get the full um, screen and presentation slides that they'll be sent over to you. Any questions at all, please just drop us an email and you'll have our contact details. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks so much, all of you. Um, it's been, I, I know it's not just me who's found this a really interesting and useful session. So thank you so much um, for your time and sharing what you're doing. Um, I, I can just let people know there is a link in the chat now to a survey so that you can uh, give your evaluation. Um, and, uh, and thanks everybody for attending as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Bye.